Okay. Oh, I suppose some classes get out at 10, too, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you. <laughs> hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, thanks for coming. I know everybody's really busy. Um, so to get you over the noon hour, boy, I'm honored to have you here. And uh, especially because I see people from many different departments on campus, um, especially even off of, off of campus. So that's great. Um, and that seems like that's what these seminars are all about, and especially what ethnobotany, my research interest, is all about, is to blend so many different disciplines. So, good to see you. Let's refer to our handout first, and I'll read the first quote. What is the pill which will keep us well, serene, contented? Not my or thy great-grandfather's, but our great-grandmother nature's universal vegetable botanic medicines by which she has kept herself young always, outlived so many old pars in her day, and fed her health with their decaying fatness. Henry David Thoreau, and I simplified it with the following quote, there are a lot of cool plants out there. <laughs> um, so that's the bottom line about our talk today. Traditional medicine is modern medicine. I often hear people say, well, traditional medicine is a thing of the past, and now we're into the modern medicine, which I put in quotes because I don't like the term. So that's a little bit what um, I'll talk to you about today. But of course, this is part two, and I hope some of you were able to make part one. Give some credit to Larry Landsberg here, who um, had a really amazing film, Dream People of the Amazon. He talked about the Achuar, and it was a very captivating talk about plants and about the fight against big oil. So this is, um, we wanted to dovetail these two talks together. Now, if I had my choice, the talk would have actually been titled, we clinicians have a lot to learn from traditional medicine. Many herbal medicines are effective. Better patient outcomes reduce than But it seemed like it was too long of a title. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so we stuck with what we had. Today's goals, I would like to talk to you about ethnobotany, um, what it is, um, what it is that I study, some of the successes and plant cases that have come out of ethnobotany and research. Um, there are some challenges that are going on in the field about 
loss of traditional knowledge, biodiversity that I'd like to talk to you about. And then let's brainstorm together, and hopefully it could be a little bit more interactive, about how in the current medical system, healthcare system, can we blend in traditional knowledge and cross-cultural medical practices? So that's something that I'm particularly interested in in family medicine. Um, now brace yourself, because this, um, this is some high tech right here, and I did this myself. So plants, culture, um, lead to health. See that? <laughs> and, uh, and so it's this idea that plants and culture and people are all interacting. And I would argue that if we get that interaction and that communication improved, that the health will improve of all of us, including the environment. This may, in fact, um, be representative and symbolic of what we're shooting for. So this woman is telling her husband, now, Roger, there are so few places for a shaman left. Um, she's put him in the greenhouse. Um, I feel like, I mean, of course, it's a joke. But the idea of trying to figure out where it is that curanderos and traditional healers will fit in our society um, is what this is all about. Um, just so you know a little bit about my background, so like Alberto said, I'm a research fellow in family medicine. Um, I have a two-year position to study herbal medicine in the area. Um, some of my fellowship training was in Arizona, which is a bit of a hub for the new idea of collaborative medicine, which we call integrative medicine. And then everything else about me is pretty much, I'm a badger. Um, with all of my schooling, although Andrew Weil was in charge of our fellowship in Arizona, and I'm still on staff down there, so he's kind of a uh, one of these eminent ethnobotanists that I've had a chance to learn from. Um, of course, it goes way back. My grandmother, Opal Pansy Steer, put me to work um, pretty early in my life. I'm one, and she's making me garden with no hat. Look at that. I'm thirsty. Um, but I was involved with plants from an early age. These were the, the books that I had to memorize as a child. Uh, Forest Trees of Wisconsin and Nature's Herbal Remedies. But then it all came to a grinding halt in medical school. You can see all the plants died here, and or this is uh, the pulp from other types of plants. So I feel like in medical school, unfortunately, we're not getting this kind of um, training like they used to. Everybody used to have to make plant medicines um, in, in school, and that doesn't really happen anymore. But I still had it in my, my kind of my blood to learn about plants, and so I started to take my curiosity abroad and got a fellowship to work in um, Ecuador in the Amazon rainforest. And in the Quechua speaking people, they had a plant called the Quilapanga Shia, which is in the Asteraceae or um, Aster family. Those of you who saw me speak yesterday, including Eve, will now um, don't ruin the punchline here. <laughs> but this is um, the Quilapanga Shia. And um, we used to work with Guadabosques, which uh, forest guards. And they were all shamans on the property there um, in their part time. Um, it was hard to be a full-time shaman in that community. And so they dug up this root, and they stood around me in a semicircle with, and they each had machetes, and they said, eat this. Um, what would you do? Anybody? Would anybody eat it? Yeah, of course, you eat it. And um, so I did, and started drooling, and lost all control of my tongue and my mouth, and it all went numb. And uh, lo and behold, of course, they started laughing. They were rolling around on the ground like, you know, gringo. And, um, but they use it for toothache. So this plant, um, and I'll pass it around. I had to keep it just as a, a keepsake. I haven't actually analyzed it, but I'm sure it's got some sort of anesthetic lidocaine kind of compound in it. It works. So for any of my colleagues who are skeptical about plant medicines, what I should do actually is take that out of there and make them chew on it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my curiosity spread. And uh, here is one of the uh, curanderos that we used to work with, uh, Joaquin. And again, what does he have in his hand? A machete. It's a very um, effective teaching tool. <laughs> so we're all paying very close attention. But it's not because of that. It's because um, what he was telling us about was very, very captivating. Group of uh, nursing students from Washington State. Um, so I started to think about what it is that I could do to branch out from my medical studies. And I also had a chance to work with naturopathic physicians who are licensed in many states, not yet in Wisconsin. Um, and they are, I would argue, um, in some form, are kind of, you know, the US curanderos. They're the ones that have this kind of training um, in medicinal plants. So to be around them really, really helped to rekindle um, what my grandmother tried to do for me in the future or in the past. Now, 
we'll talk more about this, but herbal medicine in the U.S. is interesting. It, it often is in this form. And this is um, what happens to me in clinic, and I call it the shopping bag phenomenon, where someone comes in for a visit in my practice and they dump out the supplements that they're taking and they ask for my opinion about it. Um, it's, a, it's a completely different form of herbal medicine, but nonetheless, it's very popular here. Um, 40, 50 percent of Americans are taking some sort of dietary supplement or vitamin in this form. So I had to start to pay attention to this. And another way to kind of in the U.S. to learn about plants is through all these databases and electronic resources and some good books. And so it, it helped, but it felt to me like we were missing something. It felt like I was just swapping out a plant for a pill. And that's not really the way that traditional medicine incorporated plants in their practice. So, I mean, I could do this. Aricept we use for Alzheimer's. Um, ginkgo, we think, helps prevent cognitive decline in people that already have dementia. So it's not a bad substitution, but it's kind of missing some of what we're really shooting for. And even when I try to look at these three plants that have the common um, a commonality, which is the aroma of lemon. Does anyone know what these three plants are? This one's easy, right? Lemon, lemon, lemon balm, but it could be lemon verbena, but I, this is lemon balm. Yeah, and this? Lemon grass. So they all have this aroma of lemon, and my biochemical side was like, okay, what's going on here? This is citral, which is a very volatile compound that gives us the aroma. And it's really interesting, citral has a bunch of very fascinating effects, antifungal, antibacterial, anti-cancer even, um, works as a sedative to the GI tract and helps people as a digestive. Um, they're now putting it into beers. The Honey Citral IPA from uh, Northern Michigan is something that I want to try, I haven't yet. Um, and limonene is another compound in lemon. So, I mean, I could just learn about plants this way, get the biochemistry, it's kind of interesting but it still felt to me like it's not true traditional medicine. And I really felt like I had to get back to this idea of the language of plants, which is why I'm so glad that we're doing this, uh, th these couple of lectures. So can anyone tell what this is? You can probably read the sign, right? <laughs> yeah, shoot. <laughs> I was gonna block out the sign. Um, one way to refer to this plant is LGP, little green plant. Anybody bird watch here? Okay. LBBs, little brown birds? Okay, anyway, sometimes you don't know how to identify things. But this is stevia, and it's in the medicinal plant garden at the University of Washington. And I would take medical students there, and we would walk around, and we would taste plants and experience them and get a little bit back into what these plants really are rather than just being a capsule. So this is a, a stevia, which not only is a, a natural sweetener, but actually helps with diabetes in the sense of, of improving the use of glucose by the blood and um, kicking out insulin from the pancreas. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of language of plants, getting away from databases, getting away from capsules, and having this kind of relationship with plants that I'll argue um, absolutely is clinically relevant. So if you're up for it, um, let me pass a few things around. And I think the first one we should start with is um, kava kava. And just in the sake of uh, kind of hygiene, I am in the healthcare field, take a little bit of this root if you want to with the spoon and put it on your hand and then taste it. Um, this is an example of, of a taste that humans probably clued in on in order to find medicinal plants in the past. And what, what's the classic taste that, is, that can be a guide to medicinal activity? Bitter. Bitter. So a lot of these phytoactive compounds like alkaloids, flavonoids, tannins that have some effect in humans have a bitter flavor to them. So, this is classic, and you'll notice it's very bitter. Um, so let's see, how can we do this? I suppose we can go around this way. Um, and uh, if you just take a little tiny piece, you'll get that flavor. And then we'll chase it with stevia, because you'll hate me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you'll find that that, uh, that can be pretty strong. So then we'll pass around. Just take a little tiny bit of that stevia. I think it'll make it around. Um, so taste is something that, that I encourage people to do when they're interacting with plants in order to, you know, provided you know what you're doing, because I don't want you to taste poison ivy, for instance. Um, so uh, uh, getting to kind of have that relationship a little bit on that level. The other would be looking at plants, um, feeling plants. 
um, smelling plants, taking a leaf and crushing it in your hand to release essential oils. These are all guides that we can do to kind of get more in touch with what plants do and possibly what medicinal uses they have. And that's all what our ancestors um, invariably did to learn about plants. And the other might be um, in the field of nascent pharmacology, or it's the term that refers to the study of how we first learned about plants. Um, what, what do we call it when you look at a plant and it has, a, um, it has a, an appearance that might guide its medicinal use? Doctrine of signatures. So this, um, you look at a plant and it's got, it looks like the lobe of a liver. So it might work on the hepatic system. Or this is um, ginseng. What does that kind of look like? You keep this family friendly. <laughs> um, so some people would argue that, that ginseng looks like a, a human, just sort of their whole body kind of. And it fits then with its use in traditional Chinese medicine and as we know as a tonic, that it affects the whole body. It, um, it has kind of a global effect on the human system. So, you know, whether or not the doctrine of signatures really fits scientifically, it is kind of interesting. And um, I was going to pass this around um, and ask you what the doctrine of signatures on this would be, but, uh, but then it struck me that that wasn't going to lead us in the right direction. Um, but we'll talk about this later. Um, the idea of, you know, sight and uh, for a variety of different plant parts. Has anybody had a chance to try the kava? Yeah, what's going on? Anything positive or negative? Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, actually, not sorry about that. That was the expected outcome. Um, and then the, uh, I think the stevia will help you then. All right. So this idea of language of plants, having a little bit of an experience. So I'm glad that you um, oh, were up for this. Oh, let's do this one too. Um, so this is lemongrass. Has anybody cooked with lemongrass before? Yeah, and what, uh, what kind of dishes do you make with it? Thai curries, soups, all kinds of things. There's an olive oil extract that makes a good salad dressing. Anybody use Epicurean for their recipes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got 20 different recipes on there. And uh, if we had more time, we'd cook something up for you guys. But uh, <laughs> budgets are low, time is limited. Um, so this is lemongrass, of course, and I bought this at um, the Midway Asian Foods, and they have a big stack of it there. It's really inexpensive. And um, I really encourage you to take some of this home. So this was meant to give everybody a little souvenir of lemongrass. And you can pick up the citral scent here. In this form, it's probably pretty dilute. You're not going to get that antibacterial effect, probably. Um, the anti-cancer effect is a little bit more concentrated. So extracts of lemongrass, or probably the leaves, have a higher concentration of that essential oil. But nonetheless, you can get a flavor. And please take some of that root with you and smell it all day long and think about this great talk. <laughs> OK. Um, so that gets us into how else can we learn about the language of plants? So we've you've got this idea we can start to experience things. And I'm guessing that because you're here, you do this in, on your own regular, uh, regularly anyway. Um, and then I'm going to make some really strong arguments for how interacting with traditional healers can bring us to a new level of our knowledge and understanding of plants. And there are many re reasons to care, whether you're a researcher, or a conservationist, or a clinician. One of the preeminent scholars in traditional healing is Richard Evan Schultes, who passed away a few years ago. Um, he did a lot of his work in the Amazon, and here he is accepting a delivery of snuff from a, um, uh, one of the indigenous people he was working with. And he started you know, a long time ago working with the Kiowa Indians and their use of peyote. He was very interested in psychoactive substances. He found the tradition at, traditional Aztec mushroom that was used ceremonially um, for his PhD thesis. Just a fascinating guy. But his whole deal, and he was one of the first to do this, with, which was less of an imperialistic approach to ethnobotany and more of a, an immersion and interdisciplinary approach of ethnobotany. So he participated in every ritual ever. So he absolutely would have chewed on that root that I passed around. Like, that was his approach. He lived in villages. He had pro profound respect for people. Um, he was kind of a shy guy, but nonetheless was out there and learning and, and learning languages and doing all of that, um, and was very involved with conservation. So that was his big deal. And look at how many plants he collected. Just an insane number of plants and 1,500 medicines and arrow poisons was another article that he published. 
So just a fascinating guy. And um, I wish I had a chance to study with him. But what's really interesting is that Andrew Weil was one of his students at Harvard, um, as was uh, Mark Plotkin, Wade Davis. Any of these kind of names ring a bell? Um, a lot of pretty popular authors on this topic of ethnobotany. So we have some of Richard Schulte's students out and about who um, a lot of us have a chance to learn from. So I was trying to figure out when I was in medical school, went to Ecuador, what I could do to kind of use that Schulte's approach and, and broaden out this language of plants idea. And we've already learned about the toothache plant, which I'm going to call the drooling plant, <laughs> just because it's a little bit more accurate. But there were a bunch of other plants that we collected down there that I thought were interesting. And this is one that conga ants are these massive, biting, stinging ants, um, which can cause a very severe local reaction. And they would use a, a poultice of Aristolochia and take away that reaction on the skin. Um, but what's really interesting is that if you ingest Aristolochia, it, it probably is liver toxic. So, and when I would share that information with people, because this plant has been avoided by other cultures around the world, they were grateful for that knowledge, at the same time surprised. So um, learning about plants, some really great stuff, some things that I thought were um, possibly not safe. And then a lot of work that needed to be done, and I told the class yesterday about this too, but Chonta Chiri, we're still working on actually identifying that species. And um, I was joking that it'd be a bummer if this species disappeared because of deforestation and we lost our new shampoo. So it's um, just, of course, a joke, but it's nice to, um, to know that for us that are really interested in this topic, there's a lot to do, and there's a lot of plants that we still have yet to identify and make sure that they're still around. And then there's a lot of common plants. We're all familiar with oregano um, right here in the front, and it has some uses that I never knew about um, until I went down there. I used it as a spice um, in tomato sauce, but it's got all kinds of interesting uses for gastrointestinal um, issues. So anybody ever had a tea of oregano for kind of dyspepsia indigestion? Anybody ever tried that? Yeah, very common throughout uh, Latin America. And, um, and in fact, with our students last summer, we went down to Ecuador and we had something went around and a lot of people were really, really sick. And that's what a lot of the host families started with. They started with romero or uh, rosemary and oregano as our first line treatment. And then and sometimes that worked and other times I would swing in and give them Cipro. <laughs> and so, so I think the modern world is interesting where we have a blend of, of all these different things to use. When you start to delve in traditional medicine, you're going to find it's a bit of a can of worms. There's a, there's a lot of interesting things that come up um, and a lot of surprises. So one of my Brazilian patients wanted to lose weight and um, wanted me to prescribe this cocktail um, for her, which would work really, really well. So um, ephedra is a banned plant because it has some severe heart and, um, and stroke kind of toxicity. Lasix is a diuretic, which is a, a prescription drug. And then bovine thyroid is, a, is kind of a cow version of our own thyroid. So it revs up metabolism and works as a diuretic. Um, it's a really effective weight loss aid, they aid that is um, extremely kind of dangerous. And so when you start to like look into things, there's, there's the gamut of, um, of things that are going out there, uh, that are going on out there that could require some... Um, uh, kind of discussion and improvement, I would say. Um, and the other, there's a lot of unknowns. Has anybody heard of hudia before? Yeah, this is a plant that um, has traditional use, which I'll tell, about you in, uh, tell you about in a minute. Um, PubMed wide, is, this is the way that I find um, uh, scientific articles and clinical trials. And in 2002, there was only one article on there. And now we're up to about 11, if not more. Databases say that there's just no data. Nobody, none of the big databases that I'm used to in plant medicine have any information. But the internet and retail site is absolutely overwhelming. <laughs> so th this is another thing that's happening with traditional medicine and plants is you'll get um, a traditional use plant that gets absorbed by a pharmaceutical company or another company and it spreads like wildfire um, well ahead of the science. So what else do we know about Hudia? It's in the milkweed family, Ahudia gordonii. The sand peoples of the Kalahari use it for all kinds of things. For abdominal cramps, hemorrhoids, TB, diabetes. Um, when I see a list like that, anybody a little skeptical about that kind of a list? <laughs> uh, 
Um, most of my colleagues would say that instantly disproves that that plant does anything because there's no way that it could help diabetes and hemorrhoids at the same time. Whereas I look at that and I say, huh, I wonder if there's some phytochemical overlap, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. So it actually piques my interest um, rather than make me more skeptical. But that said, it also is used as an appetite suppressant when they're doing long walks in the desert and they don't have any food and they need to kind of get rid of their appetite. And then Pfizer and SlimFast have all gotten involved and found some chemical, but it's also been listed under the uh, Council for uh, International Trade and Endangered Species um, because it's really slow growing and it's being over harvested. So you can see all the different layers here. You see the traditional use, which might be a little confusing, might be kind of relevant. You've got big companies involved. You've got endangered species kind of problems happening. This in the internet retail, go ahead and plug it into Google. I think there were, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand hits. So because of its weight loss use in the United States. So it's really, it's really interesting. I think it really begs for a lot of us to get involved and try to find out you know, what's going on in all those different layers. So its traditional use might be relevant to this current use. And I would argue that we could turn to traditional use in this case to help kind of bring the, um, that retail internet sales kind of up to science. And so maybe traditional healers could help us fill that gap. So that's one example of um, kind of a neat use of traditional medicine. Everybody doing OK? Yeah, everybody's tongues recover? <laughs> yeah, was there enough stevia to go around? OK. Oh, there's still some left? Yeah, uh, yeah, if you need more stevia, please, <laughs> please help yourself. I didn't clean the lemongrass, but if you trust, uh, trust the grocery store, I suppose you could chew on that, too. <laughs> and uh, maybe that would help. I was going to bring some, some. Over in the corner um, of the table there, there's a sign-in sheet. If you're interested in being added to our listserv, if you are already on it, you heard about this talk uh, poster elsewhere. Um, we do have a weekly newsletter that we send out um, every, well, every Thursday when we get it done on time, <laughs> um, of all of the events we have for the upcoming week, next week or two. Um, offer academic programming, we have uh, funding that we give grants to community organizations and um, faculty for um, travel grants, et cetera, there's information about that. And what else? Oh, and then um, Dr. Cooper actually made a fantastic handout to, uh, for all of you to look at, to kind of look at various presentations and take along with you. So if you didn't get a copy, there's copies in the corner over there, and if we run out, and you didn't get one, I can Thanks so much for coming, and I'll turn it over to Alberto. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah, and, and uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I really you welcome to the second of this series, People Who Understand the Language of Plants, and our speaker, David, is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank All right. you. <laughs> That's the bottom line about our talk today. Traditional medicine is modern medicine. I often hear people say, well, traditional medicine is a thing of the past, and now we're into the modern medicine, which I put in quotes because I don't like the term. So that's a little bit what um, I'll talk to you about today. But of course, this is part two, and I hope some of you were able to make part one. Give some credit to Larry Landsberg here, who um, had a really amazing film dream people of the Amazon. He talked about the Achuar, and it was a very captivating talk about plants and about the fight against big oil. So this is, um, we wanted to dovetail these two talks together. Now, if I had my choice, the talk would have actually been titled, We Clinicians Have a Lot to Learn from Traditional Medicine. Many Herbal Medicines Are Effective. Better Patient Outcomes Reduce Side of the Improvement. But it seemed like it was too long of a title. 
<laughs> so, so, uh, so we stuck with what we had. Today's goals, I would like to talk to you about ethnobotany, um, what it is, um, what it is that I study, some of the successes and plant cases. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, thanks for coming. I know everybody's really busy. Um, so to get you over the noon hour, boy, I'm honored to have you here. And uh, especially because I see people from many different departments on campus, um, especially even off of, off of campus. So that's great. Um, and that seems like that's what these seminars are all about, and especially what ethnobotany, my research interest, is all about, is to blend so many different disciplines. So good to see you. Let's refer to our handout first, and I'll read the first quote. What is the pill which will keep us well, serene, contented? Not my or thy great grandfather's, but our great grandmother nature's universal vegetable botanic medicines, by which she has kept herself young always, outlived so many old pars in her day, and fed her health with their decaying fatness. Henry David Thoreau. And I simplified it with the following quote. There are a lot of cool plants out there. <laughs> um, so, Okay. Oh, I suppose some classes get out at 10, too, so, yeah. Oh. Alberto Vargas introduces our speaker for today. 